So, good afternoon to all of you. Um, Vienna Humani Humanities Festival, the second day. Welcome to this and welcome to uh, this session on the power of the powerless. The title of the whole festival is uh, Macht und Ohnmacht, Power and Powerlessness. Uh, the piece that we are going to discuss uh, today uh, has both of these in the title, the power of the powerless, it has Macht and Ohnmacht, power and powerlessness already in the title. And um, we are going to discuss this piece by Václav Havel. And if you read uh, the program that was coming out for the U Vienna Humanities Festival, you will find this one big sentence in the program about uh, this event this afternoon, saying it was probably the greatest text ever written depicting the nature and the fragility of late communist power. Quote from our program, this is quite an announcement on the one hand, quite a big sentence, and on the other hand also, it maybe it can be understood as a signal, okay, this is late communist power, uh, why should we really care any longer today? But before this uh, thought really takes place in our minds, uh, I would like to link it back to um, a lecture that was opening, to the lecture that was opening the Vienna Humanities Festival on Thursday, the lecture by Tim Snyder. I guess some of you or many of you might have been for that talk. And as it turns out, uh, Tim Snyder not only has published a new book, uh, The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, that was the book that he was presenting on Thursday, but he has also written a new foreword, a new introduction to a new edition of Václav Havel's Power of the Powerless in English. And when I quoted this one sentence saying, this is the greatest text ever written depicting the nature and fragility of late communist power, uh, Tim Snyder tells us, in fact, this is not only depicting the, the nature and fragility of late communist power, it is precisely depicting modern unfreedom, it is precisely depicting our uh, uh, contemporary uh, Western societies. This is his statement in his introduction to the new English edition of this book. So I think both of these statements open up a space that will uh, be um, um, the ground that we, that we relate to in our to discussion today, namely both aspects. On the one hand, the historical meaning that this te text has and had, uh, the historical circumstances of its being written and uh, the immediate impacts and effects that it had on the later development, maybe leading up uh, to the Velvet Revolution of 1989, and also on its contemporary meaning. And luckily, I'm not the only one to share this with you tonight, this afternoon, sorry, it's not yet night. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, with me, I have uh, Milan Hanisch. I'm very happy to have him here on the stage. Milan Hanisch is a colleague from Prague, um, assistant professor at the Faculty of Humanities at Charles University, Prague. Um, he held, holds a uh, MA in uh, Philosophical and Social Anthropology from Charles University as well as a PhD from the same university in Philosophical Anthropology. The topic of his uh, dissertation, his thesis was uh, dedicated to as he calls it, the Apostle of the Philosophers, St. Paul, so a philosophical reading of uh, St. Paul, I guess. But very much of, it, of his recent work has also been dedicated to topics that are much closer to what we are doing today. Hannah Arendt was a name that was very important for his research. He has worked and written a lot on Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, concepts of republicanism and also especially on the concept of civil disobedience in Hannah Arendt, which also brings us closer to um, uh, today's talk. And obviously Václav Havel as well, and this is what we are going to discuss with you now. And I'd like to say as a statement of welcome to, Mila, to Milan, Milan, I'm very happy that uh, you're joining us on this. And also I take it as a good indicator for the relevance of Havel's text that you, as a, a relatively young scholar, uh, dedicate your work to this. You were not even born when the text uh, uh, on the power of the powerless was written. And at a time when uh, uh, Havel himself is almost a persona non grata on the Czech political scene, uh, when very few people still discuss his concept and maybe do not even take him serious as a politician any longer, I think it take it as a very good indicator that you dedicate your work to him and his work. And dedicating does not mean that you are uncritical, 
the real evil is ignorance, I think, and uh, you, we can still be critical, but you are working on this, and I take this as a good indicator. So, to start, just for the setup of this uh, talk uh, this afternoon, um, I promise to you that we will leave time towards the end. Sometimes this is a problem when the stage uh, gets off and uh, talks, uh, the people just talk among themselves. This will not be the case. I promise to you I will leave the last, at least the last 20 minutes for the discussion with all of you. I cannot promise that all of you will have uh, the saying that he or she wants to have, but I will promise that we leave the time for, the, for this. So to, to start, Milan, um, the title of the Vienna Humanities Festival is Power and Powerlessness. If you go to the talks, um, I can just, uh, I would just say, I would hold the bet that very many or all of them will speak about power. But will there be talks that, will, that do also speak about powerlessness? I'm not really sure. If you have the title Macht und Ohnmacht, this is like power and something. But the something is not really interesting. It's just the little antagonism at the end, Macht und Ohnmacht. In fact, I would say that maybe this neglected Ohnmacht, this neglected powerlessness, the second element of the title, is maybe something that is extremely relevant for discussions of today. And if you, and that is my impression, if, if you look at the polit political uh, setup of today, I think very much of what we are discussing is actually emotions or feeling of powerlessness. And if you relate this to the populist movement that we are speaking about everywhere in Europe and in the world, uh, this is an emotion of powerlessness, right? I mean, we, uh, we, we are not listened to, nobody understands what we want to say, nobody listens to us, the elites, they, they do their own stuff, they don't listen to us. But funnily, also those who are spoken about, the elites, they, they say the very same thing. Well, it's, this is not in our influence, this is not us. And even the politicians tell us, well, there was no alternative, I had to do this, we are totally powerless. So this discussion on powerlessness seems to be something that uh, is highly relevant for our time. And I think it is a good uh, opportunity to discuss this going back to this one iconic, crucial text uh, written by Václav Havel um, in 1978 on the power of the powerless. And maybe, Milan, this is a starting point for you where you uh, can have like a first reflection on the meaning of power and powerlessness in Havel. And then I say in a second approach we will also try to speak more about the historical meaning and the historical impacts that it had. Please, Milan. Okay, okay, thank you, Ludger, for a nice introduction and thank you for coming and having me. Um, um, firstly, let's draw a picture. Imagine yourself being in a heavily controlled authoritarian society led by a party which is backed by the uh, mighty empire. Um, you can add to the picture that the empire sent hundreds of thousands of troops and tanks into the country just a few years ago. And a vast part of them still remained to maintain the political stability. Additionally, all of those who in the years before the invasion of the occupiers tried to achieve a certain amount of freedom and proposed some reforms were fired from their jobs uh, after the occupiers consolidated their power. And so how would you feel? Where would be the hope? And um, yeah, would you feel powerful or powerless? Well, you could have easily noticed that I have in mind a particular example of Czechoslovakia after the Prague Spring and the Soviet invasion. But I have a reason why I put it in a more general way, since um, similarly to Ludger, um, I want to point to a universal problem of power and powerlessness. Um, um, the 70s in the Czechoslovakia were, as it were, an era of hopelessness or the age of a dead-like motionlessness. Um, many of the previously active people felt desperate with no sense of power to change the current social or political affairs. Um, but luckily not everyone felt into despair and there were dissenters among among them, of course, Václav Havel, one of the most famous one, and their stance was different. Um, he still, Havel still tried to act freely, even in an authoritarian society, and it happened to, happened to be at least partially possible. In the 1975, he wrote a public letter to Gustav Husák, the president of Czechoslovakia and the general secretary of the Communist Party, 
Um, in the letter, um, he harshly pointed to, uh, to the lies, to the cultural, moral, and political decay. Um, the question why he did it. Did he really think that Gustav Husak would read the letter? and that he would take the analysis seriously and his advices? Probably not. His aim was not to cause a sudden political change. The real aim was to do something freely, independently, and as it were, throw those who were in power into the situation in which they will have to react. Thus it was an act of rebellion, since an individual was required to adjust to the requirements and expectations of those who hold power. Now it was Havel who did something unexpected and created a situation in which the holders of power felt un uncomfortable. A few years later, uh, Havel published this wonderful essay, The Power of the Powerless, which is probably the most influential and most famous text uh, written in Czech. Um, so who is powerless? According to Havel, what he, what he wrote in the essay, almost nobody is powerless, even in a regime backed by the seemingly almighty empire. There are still some potentialities left even among the seemingly powerless people. And to understand the possibilities, one has to understand the nature of power. So power, according to Havel, is not a possession of the ruling party, nor it is located on the very top of society by the hands of the few. Instead, power permeates every individual and every each social interaction. So power is not top-down relation or possession of the few. That would not mean that the Communist Party would have no power at all. It still had the army, intelligence agencies, police, who can bully everyone. But it does not mean much without unquestioned obedience and performance of political rituals by the ordinary people. So I would say firstly, power is a performative. How do power works practically and how it permeates society? This Havel describes with the famous story of the greengrocer who put the Communist Party slogan into the window of the shop. Um, why he did it, asks Howell. Did he believe in the words which were on the slogan? You know that there was written workers of the world unite, the last imperative of the Communist Manifesto? Well, probably not. He did not even notice what's written on the slogan. He put it into the window because it is expected and everyone does in the same way. Um, so why are people doing this? Why are they putting slogans in their windows, the meaning of which is unimportant to them? Well, our greengrocer green grocer did it because the thing must be done to maintain his standard of living and his job. Basically, according to Howell, this means that he has fear. He is afraid of uh, losing his job and potential consequences. So it has a very clear meaning for him. It expresses his loyalty and provides him the expectation of an undisturbed life. He knows that until he is doing what he is expected to do, he would maintain the job and he would not face any bad treatment. And so how he is related to the power? By acting according to the expectations, a greengrocer is not without his share in power or to say it morally without his guilt. By putting his slogan into the window, he reproduces the ideology. He reproduces the power and even strengthens it. By doing this, he naturally produces pressure on other greengrocers, greengrocers and other people to do the same. He becomes, as it were, complicit in maintaining and enhancing the power of the regime. But Havel's goal is not to blame a greengrocer, but rather to show the potentiality in his situation. What if he did not put the slogan into his window? The others would then see that disobedience is possible, and maybe they might even join him.
And even if he remains alone, the place of ideology is questioned. The almighty power of the regime is partially shaken. The potentiality of political change is then open, even if it, if it is not yet fully used and realized. However, Howell is in the essay not so much concerned with the question of how to reform the regime, how to overthrow it, what kind of institutional changes should be done. He focuses instead um, more on a moral life of an individual. Life in a, he calls it post-totalitarian society, enforce people to pretend that an official lie is truth enforce them to repeat those lies, share them, spread them, <clears throat> speak them out in schools, in jobs, in offices. So um, an individual need not accept all the lies and mystifications, as it were, internally into their minds, but they must behave as though they believe them. They have to pretend that they believe them. So this all pervasive presence of lying and pretending, according to Havel, might profoundly damage humans' personality, dignity, and moral integrity. So what a greengrocer would gain when he refuses to put a meaningless slogan into the window of the shop? It is not primarily a hope for a near political change. What he will gain is more important and more profound. It is a moral recovery, according to Havel. An act of refusal or disobedience is an act of comeback of an alienated self, a comeback of human dignity. And that's particularly important for Havel, authenticity. He says basically this. It is not so much important to attempt for the change of the whole political system and present a whole vision or a new competing worldview, new ideology. What is more important is to live authentically in accord with one's conscience and moral convictions. So what kind of reward one gets for disobedience? What kind of satisfaction? For Hubble, there is no direct positive reward from outside. Maybe even consequences might be harsh and unpleasant for him. Maybe he will not be promoted. His children will be punished by not being allowed to study. But real satisfaction for a leap in authenticity and truth comes from inside. A person who refuses to live in lie regains one's last dignity and freedom. And there is even something more still, a hope. Life in truth unveils the lies of the system and might inspire others to act similarly. Beneath the surface of the ideological facade dwells the so-called intentions of life. That is authentic human wishes and life goals. These are very diverse and they do not fit usually into the ideology of the real socialism. The examples, like a wish to go to a rock concert or to read a forbidden book, to organize a meeting or party with friends to care for the environment, or simply to work professionally in a thoroughly corrupted economical system. In a heavily controlled society, these are all potentially political acts, and sooner or later the regime must burn out since it provides not enough personal freedom for people to pursue their very diverse life goals. The argumentation of the essay was compelling and influential among the dissident, dissenters and oppositional circles in the societies of real socialism, and it remains its attractiveness still today among the people who are in, position, in opposition to authoritarian regimes. Even if there is no hope for a sudden political change, it has still a meaning to refuse to participate in the reproduction of the power relations. But you would not probably expect from me just a summary of Havel's argument, and I should also provide you, at least briefly, with my opinion. Um, so here it is. I think one thing in this context particularly deserves our attention. 
Howell's analysis of the structure of power is excellent, and even the description of the possibilities of the individual are revealing. But what I personally miss in the text is a clear answer to one question, and it is following. How could you convince someone who does not care so much about moral issues and authenticity that it still makes sense to refuse obedience to the regime? You might say that there are things for which it is worth to suffer, which was a motto of Charter 77. But to accept this claim, one already has to have a serious concern about his or her moral integrity. And that's apparently not happening by everybody. The conscience and moral, moral stances are very diverse, and the conscience doesn't speak to the same voice to everybody. I mean, this question is not unimportant since to really turn the seeming powerlessness into power at the center needs to attract support from other citizens. And I mean, not just a tiny group of Charter 77 signatories, but better a vast masses of people. Well, I, would not, I don't want to blame the centers for what they did or did not do in the difficult past. Um, I, but I just want to teach myself a lesson, and I think here is a lesson. Moral arguments and moral concerns might be crucially important and decisive for some people, but might not be as essential and not so convincing for others. Well, we can express our grief for the fact. We can pity the people who do not care very much about the moral, issue, moral values we share, about authenticity, about conscience, but we have to count on it and do not presuppose that an existential revolution and moral reconstitution might happen on a broader scale. Just, and yeah, maybe a more feasible way of opposition was made in Poland a few years later, where intellectuals joined workers and articulated common interests and opinions and thus formed a very massive movement of solidarity, which the regime in Poland had to take very seriously. This does not happen, this did not happen in Czechoslovakia. And maybe one of the reasons for that was that Charter 77 did not speak out things which more people painfully felt as problems in their lives. The dissenters did not clearly speak out people's real problems, people's discontent with the regime and with, with their life in, under, uh, in, in late socialism. Um, and so finally, I want to make one conclusion related to the topic of power and powerlessness. Howell was right. Power is not a possession of the government or a ruling class. But I think one thing needs to be added. Power is not a possession of any individual, nor a party member, nor an oppressed citizen. Power appears only where more people join each other and share the same opinion or interest. Only when they join each other and act publicly, they might form a power group which can be seen and must be respected. If the opinion which they articulate is convincing enough for the many, they might be even powerful enough to expose a serious pressure on government. I think if one does not take into account this fact about power, one will remain as powerless as before. So that's basically my first, first introduction Thank to you, the Mila. question of powerless, and I'm looking forward to your yes. opinions, Lugar. Yes. Um, Many things could be said. <laughs> Obviously, you have, many, you have really, um, 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 uh, touched upon many things in your talk. I will reduce it to the two keywords that are announced in the very beginning, power and powerlessness. I will have two questions for you, Milan. Maybe you can try to address them shortly. And afterwards, I will, uh, in a second step, I will also ask you about the historical importance of this text, because, as I said in the beginning, 1978, October 1978, in fact, it's exact 40 years, so I think, and this is a milestone somehow, and it deserves to remem be remembered as a historical milestone, so we will try to do that before we open up to all of you. So two short questions on what you just said on these two main 
key issues of power and powerlessness. Václav Havel's concept in Power of the Powerless is pathetic. I think this is <laughs> not <laughs> a daring uh, uh, thing to say. It's highly pathetic. Uh, the concept of power that he's relating to uh, relies on just one single factor. And this one single factor is truth. Truth is the one that gives power to the powerless. Truth is the one that creates, generates power, brings about power. Highly pathetic, I said. I mean, if you have once read it, you will never forget. Uh, Václav Havel says, truth is a bacteriological we weapon. It's infectious. Once you tell it to the people, they will give it on. Uh, this kind of power does not rely on an army of its own. It does not rely on a party of its own. Uh, the only thing that it relies on is the army of the enemy. And the truth that goes over to the army of the enemy and converts, so to speak, the whole army of the enemy for, for your point because you have the uh, quality of truth, or this is what is on your side. He calls it an existential revolution. He says any kind of revolution that just goes for systematic change, this is not what we intend. Not because we would be afraid uh, of radical solutions. No, in fact, any uh, revolution that just aims at systemic change is not radical enough for us. We want to be more radical. We want to have an existential revolution, which means, and this brings me back to what I said in the beginning, Tim Snyder in his lecture on Friday, this is exactly where he relates to Tim Snyder uh, uh, in his fo new foreword to um, uh, Václav Havel's says, uh, book says, Havel's diagnosis is a diagnosis of our contemporary, today's modern unfreedom, in which individuals enslave themselves because they do not ask themselves who they are and what they should be doing. Who are we? What should, what should we be doing? These are the two essential questions. These are the two essential questions that uh, Tim Snyder brings up. These are the two essential questions that Václav Havel brings up in his talk. It is exactly not to be ideological, but to be always critical about yourself, to always ask you, yourself, and this kind of truth, this kind of existential truth, allegedly, according to Václav Havel, is what brings about power. How do you react to this concept today? As I said, we, it's very easy to make fun of it. It's very easy to say, oh, this is so highly pathetic. But I just mentioned a highly influential author of our days, Tim Snyder, who gave this lecture in front of 1,000 people on Thursday, who relates exactly to the same uh, uh, issue, I'd say. Okay. Um Thanks for the question. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm just thinking how to put it. <clears throat> well, to me, this kind of reasoning as personally, yeah, persuasive. But I'm asking myself whether this kind of reasoning as per persuasive enough also to my fellow citizens, and this is, I think, the question we should we should ask ourselves if we <laughs> if we are uh, unsatisfied with the political situation. Um, you know, um, how was a say and and what Timothy Snyder said on Thursday? It, it is appealing to intellectuals. Um, Howell's text gained much influence, but among intellectuals, um, among, as it were, intellectual elites. Um, it's very easy when you take this argument seriously and you try to push, push it in the public space to fall into the danger that you are you are, as it were, posing yourself in a, in a position where you preach and where you teach someone who, who is, you know, uneducated. And I think that's a real danger, intellectuals and, and politicians who, uh, real, danger, real danger they, we need to avoid. And, and the threat is here since this would bring kind of a you know cultural conflict into politics, and um, and as intellectuals, we can never win this war, since the populists will be more successful in dividing people, 
And so what then is truth? Yeah. You know, to, to teaching people about about facts, about about truth is is very difficult, and and we we've seen in many countries in the world today that uh, this type of approach and this type of moral moral arguments um, are not successful enough. Um. I mean, I, I, I'd just like to add on this, and then we can go over to the powerlessness. Uh, I'd just like to add on this. I, this is so interesting in Tim Snyder's reading of the book and in his foreword that he says, what seemed to be very odd to us some 10 or 15 years ago, he, or he personally said it when I read it some 20 years ago, and Havel speaks about, you know, all this technology, this Heideggerian approach, technology is so, so powerful that it overcomes us. We, can, we are not individuals ourselves any longer, but we are governed from somewhere else. To, to, to him, this always sounded very pathetic and out of time, but when you read it today, this is actually... <laughs> Uh, the, the moment when it starts speaking, it, it, it's all true today. It's all there, yeah? So all this analysis that seemed to be so outdated in Havel is actually the v very co current topic of today. Maybe we can go on with this in, in the discussion. I'll leave it as it, as, the, as it is for the moment. One more question on powerlessness. Maybe also you can have a short reaction on that. As I said in the beginning, I think maybe, maybe to discuss powerlessness, Ohnmacht, uh, is in some sense the more interesting issue than power. Everybody's speaking about power, but as I said, the, the, the debates of today are those of powerlessness and of uh, people who, who feel powerless, who are powerless. One could say that, well, in some sense, people have more power than ever before in a technological sense. We, we, we can do more, we can, uh, we, in an instrumental sense, we... we uh, have more goods at our hands than ever before, but nevertheless, people obviously seem powerless, and these are the debates of today. Um, but I think also this is this is maybe also a characteristic of today that this kind of this 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 argument of powerlessness can easily be misused and said, well, you know, nobody ever takes us seriously. Nobody is concerned about what we are doing, so we have to do something. We have to react on this finally, and the reaction then always becomes violent, becomes aggressive. Uh, it is a reaction of compensation since this is the state of affairs. Nobody listens to us. It's overdone. We are waiting for a kind of uh, salvation uh, uh, of a solution. Everybody understands what I'm alluding to. Uh, so it has this kind of danger. And I think also the argument of powerlessness has a, a capacity to blackmail. And this would be my question. And this already leads also over to the historical dimension of it. Did, according to your insight, uh, wasn't it also the dissidents who somehow occupied this notion of powerlessness and uh, said, well, this is, this is us, we are the powerless, and we, uh, uh, um, we are thinking about new modes of finding power, getting power, uh, doing something against this misuse of power on the other side? Because if you, if you look at it, the, the, these circles of dissidents were very small, yeah? And they were maybe these circles of dissidents were as distant from the normal population, whatever that might be, uh, than the government it, it itself. So, did they also somehow not uh, take it over as an argument in their own favor, uh, and to some sense misused it? And does this maybe explain also why it never became a mass movement? It really remained a movement in, within very close circles, right? Yeah, um, thanks. You're, you're right. Yeah, the, the opposition movement or Charter 77 remained very, it was a really tiny group of signatories, just 1,000 1, people. And uh, it was very hard for them um, to, to, to spread their ideas and, and, and they, in the regime, which was really really powerful enough to control their um, to control the spread of information, flows of information, publications, organization, etc. So so it was very hard to to be politically active in this environment. So I I, I really do not want to blame them that they uh, that they weren't so much successful since they they. Had, had a very difficult situation. Hubble was was in a home arrest and, and under total control, and it was very hard even to to push those essays out. So um, and yeah, no, 
how it worked, the organization of Charter 77. There was not a uh, an efficient structure uh, which could which could, even the signatories in the charter, some of them were very very discontent with what charter was doing and was not doing. Um, so, so in this situation where, where you had a, many people with diverse opinions in the charter who even, even they had not a proper public space as it were and they were not able to communicate enough with each other, it was very difficult to gain a, gain a support um, you know, from a wider public. Um, but maybe it was, um, maybe also this was a a result of this moral language and preoccupation of charter with moral issues. Since basically this kind of arguments were, were also blaming people. Havel tried not to do that explicitly, but it was very hard not to fall in this position that, okay, we are those who, who are brave enough to, to stay in a position and we can, we can take uh, consequences, but you not. So, you know, this kind of moral language, who is for something and who is not, it's, you know, people don't like it to be, to be, to be blamed that we are those who, who are silently supporting the regime and therefore we are not living authentically. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not an idea you can, you can, you can you can go to people and tell them you until yet twelve you haven't lived authentically, <laughs> so so you know this this is as I, as I said in my in my previous talk, uh, I think this is very persuasive for those who already share these ideas, who share this concern like care for the soul or careful yeah, uh, the leg legacy of of, of Patochka. But outside of it, it's, it's very difficult to, to gain support with such ideas. And, and Charter 77 in their documents, uh, only a few of them were dedicated to, uh, to a real social issues, like economic reform, law reform, uh, air pollution of the environment, etc. I, I think it's only seven or eight of them, uh, and there were hundreds of those documents. So uh, they even didn't try very much to, to articulate the discontent of the people. And uh, I think that's, that's a lesson we can get from it, that, that to really compete with, uh, with uh, populist or with, with the mighty power, uh, one has to ask people what, what, what's, what's their uh, discontent, what, what's, yeah, what's paining, what, what they feel as painful in their lives. And that was probably not the question of moral integrity, I'm afraid. Okay. Now I have a difficult task for you, Milan. I promise that we will leave uh, enough uh, time for the discussion. I will try to keep the promise. This is, the, s s yeah, uh, can, can, I, can we have, we have three more minutes left. <laughs> I, I will want to use these three minutes. This is why I, why I said, and then immediately we'll go over. Uh, I promise that also, Milan, that we will have at least a short look at the historical significance of this text that is in some sense a milestone. It was written in close cooperation from the very beginning with Polish uh, uh, intellectuals, with Polish dissidents. It had a huge impact immediately internationally. Uh, I know it's an impossible task, but now I give you like two minutes to just tell us about something about the historical significance. What did it mean for the development in Europe, in Eastern Europe especially? Uh, just a short glimpse at, the, at that and then we will uh, open to all of you. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. it was written in the 1978 and Havel already was after his first arrest, which, uh, which broke him. And, um, that was a very, he was in a very difficult situation. He had previously no experience of being arrested. And um, so he, he abandoned the position of a spokesperson of Charter 77. And many of the signatories of Charter were very, you know, very angry on him. Um, actually, this spread also some kind of a despair. Well, Patochka's death uh, was not such a big issue um, immediately, but still then, after, after a few months, it, it was um, 
you know, many of the people, many of the previous elective people furled into despair. And so then the idea of a parallel polis connected with uh, Václav Benda appeared, which proposed actually new um, new uh, program for how to live in an in a under late socialist regime. And it was basically this, let's create a parallel institutions, let's create parallel educational institutions, let's even try to, to create a, a parallel judiciary system. Um, so so it, it was very influential, Benda's essay. And after that came, came this famous, um, more influent, even more influential text of Howell, um, who, which, which as you as you said rightly was very uh, influential in Poland, and I think there are very it would be very difficult to compare the situation of the Czech dissenters in Polish one, since also the state of economy was different and and the role of the church in life, and so so it's you know, as as I said it's very easy to blame dissidents and dissenters in Czechoslovakia what they did not do, but they had different different circumstances, different conditions. Yeah, sorry, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, a philosopher, Gregor Flock, I would like to make a general point about the conception of power and powerlessness. Um, I don't think I don't think it's very helpful to think of this as a bivalent spectrum. That that's a term from logic. I mean, bivalence is basically the principle, scare quotes, that there are only two truth values, true and false. And I think that's a gross oversimplification. In the same sense, I think it would be a gross oversimplification to think of the power spectrum of there being only of consisting only of the two values of power and powerlessness. I think a more multivalent or gradualistic approach is called for here also for the reason that if we only think in terms of power and powerlessness, we are disempowering ourselves by, by thinking, okay, they've got the power, we are the powerless, and we are kind of overlooking the fact that we actually do have power, just less. So that's also one of the reasons for why a, a multivalent approach to modeling the, spa, the power spectrum is more helpful, in my opinion. So, any comments? Yeah, I, I think you're right, and Howell would probably agree. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah, the situation, you, you, you can frame it as there are people who have power who are almighty and who are powerless, and, and we can deconstruct this. So, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Well, I would like to ask you and add some comments uh, a little bit looking back in the context of the historical situation of the Czechoslovakia. Because uh, in my mind, Czechoslovakia had a, a, a very experienced um, democratic history, you know? So people in Czech Republic haven't been out of um, practices of how to act and how to gain power. I think uh, I would add that also this term of freedom was very, is a very important aspect in Havel's and in the whole situation's period uh, context. And if I look back to what happened at the funeral of Jan Palach, <laughs> still I'm screaming nowadays about that. And, there, and, and some of the good um, sayings of the people at this time from the Czech people, they absolutely knew that they are not powerless and that Jan Palach, for example, he took power and he showed how to react. And I think this fundamental thing to be active as an individual as, uh, and not also what in this concept of Václav Havel is so important, not to suppress, but to, to become uh, conscious of being a free person, what I am, what I should do, this is important to, to make politics. And I think he had also the long run or the long waiting to become uh, active in a moment when the historical situation made it more easier. But I think that the people and the population in the Czech Republic was 
was able and was uh, was not powerless. It was just um, a different a different situation and many uh, problems which came upon them and in the historic moment when it's ready they became active and I think congratulations again. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks for the comment. I, I'm, so I'm, I'm not a historian, I can't make any objections to what you said and so if, if you don't mind we can forward to another remarks and questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was um, wondering if you had an explanation uh, for the change of uh, Havel's uh, discourse after 1989, because as uh, I suppose any uh, Western intellectual who read uh, Power of the Powerless and Living in Truth and the, all the other uh, political essays that he wrote, I was um, stricken by the fact that it's the best analysis of, communist, of the communist dictatorship and it's everyday working that you can have. I mean, it is, I think, I thought it was brilliant and I still think until today it is brilliant. But when Havel became president, um, the, the proposal of power of the powerless, which is not to blame people, but to, uh, to tell them that they have the responsibility and the power to turn around this relationship with, with the communist regime, that they can change things if they want to at the individual level. Uh, this discourse changed completely with the um, Czech state's new politics of um, basically not saying that everybody was responsible, as Havel said, but on the contrary, that nobody was responsible, that the whole population was, uh, was a victim of the regime and only the Communist Party members and only uh, the secret police collaborators were guilty, whereas the rest of the people were innocent, yeah? which is pretty much exactly the opposite of what Havel was saying before. And yet he was the head of state and he endorsed this new politics, so at least he didn't say anything. And he was still president. So why? why is, how is it possible? Well, well, thank you for the nice question. Unfortunately, I have no clear answer to that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not so experienced in, in studying Hubble's life and intellectual development to somehow find an explanation. But yeah, the position changed dramatically. Uh, you're absolutely right in that. Maybe there's something to do with this, with this responsibility or feel some responsibility for the new state. And, and yeah, definitely. But okay, uh, I mean, when, once you get into power, you are probably not anymore a free intellectual who can question every idea. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Havel's um, an ideal political regime, let's say, uh, even though the reality was different later after the communism ended, but still what was his philosophical ideal political regime that he was creating in his mind? Because I think he was also critical about democracy, right? Yeah, you're right, and it's somehow um, related to the previous question. And there are a few shifts in Howell's intellectual development. Um, one is, um, if you take um, his discussion with Milan Kundera after uh, the Soviet invasion, there Howell simply thinks that what is to be done is to accept the Western model of parliamentary democracy. Uh, something different, he says, in The Power of the Powerless, where he is very critical towards Western democracy, towards parliamentary democracy, and proposes um, some kind of an informal, informal structure, informal relations, which should be the more important and decisive in a, in a better society, as it were. Um, and another shift then happened in the, by the end of the 80s, when he accepted simply that uh, the, the acceptance of, of a Western model, model of liberal democracy. Um, so, well, yeah, there are different questions, or at least these three possible questions to, uh, possible answers to, uh, how, to, to your question, how, what was Howell's idea of a so-called ideal society? 
So we have to share the mic now, sorry. Uh, just maybe as my answer to uh, several of the questions before, um, I think once again, um, 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 I, I just had, um, um, mentioned this, this the, the foreword of Tim Snyder to this new English edition. I think this is also what he stresses in his foreword, that actually the notion of Havel, this relates to the, your question and the question before, is actually something that he calls pre-political. So Havel is always very helpful, Havel and many others, very helpful with his existential approach to, to, to fight off ideology. Uh, Tim Snyder says, to come out under ideology, so to escape ideology, all ideological approaches, but this is what we very clearly see, and I think this was also Muriel's question and, and others, uh, the very moment uh, that this has had to be practiced as a parliamentary system when questions of when social questions, economic questions come into play, I think uh, it was all very, very quickly over. And there, you, I think you see the clear limitations of the political concepts that you have in Havel and all the dissidents. But it is a very, very helpful uh, tool, I would say, to uh, in a situation of a confrontation with uh, ideologies, totalitarian ideologies, and how to get rid of those and how to escape uh, these ideologies. Maybe this is an answer that somehow uh, re re replies to many of the questions before. I think we had one more, the lady, you, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you have one more. I oh, <laughs> that's very kind, thank you very much. Um, I have a slightly different question, actually. Um, how much do you think the Catholic faith and the Catholic perception of the world is behind Havel's paradigm of individual resistance um, and integrity. Okay, thanks. I I'm, I'm, I'm don't think it is possible to put some put Havel into some uh, some some traditional uh, traditional label like Catholic, Protestant, or pagan. No, I, I don't think it's 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 adequate to his stance. Um, he was definitely not a Catholic. Well, you can find many of the religious expression in his in his writings, particularly in letters from prison. Um, but but I wouldn't do this. Aditya, you have an urgent question. <laughs> the very last one, okay. <laughs> So, Milan, if I may ask, uh, rec uh, request your mediation for somebody who is not familiar with the text. Um, because you t we all talked about a lot of the things that he talks about in this text. Affect, performance, to act, not to act, moral, truth, consciousness. And then the fact that there was some contradiction in his own political life. Would you uh, think that actually the point of such a text then is not really to, to actually embrace all of these and the different facets, but what does he say then about recognition? Because to me from this whole discussion, it seems that the whole point of what he's saying and what Snyder was saying also is that actually how do we give people or ourselves the tools to recognize at any historical moment what the problems really are? And then we have the choice to uh, act or react. What do you find, if, would you, would you, uh, what do you think about the aspect of recognition in this? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't understand the question properly, so maybe would you be able to put it in one or two sentences briefly? Yeah. So you need again. <laughs> so uh, to put it brief, uh, to summarize it, what I, the essential point of a philosophical, let's say, message of a text like this is not so much in preaching what we should do, Rather, it's saying that, can you use this to think about whatever situation we are in and use that as a tool to recognize what the problem really is and then you can decide what to do. Would that be a fair uh, summary? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, you grasp it <laughs> perfectly. So I uh, have not much to, to add. Um, you know, the very analysis of power is very interesting, revealing. At us, we can find similar, similar stances or expressions in, in some of other books, uh, like a very early text of uh, Etienne de la Bautier, 
It's called Discourse on the Voluntary Servitude. We didn't know much about Tillin de Boitier, just that he allegedly was a friend of Michel de Montesquieu. But in the, in the text, he makes wonderful description of how power works, that actually it is not that they are, why they are succumbing to tyranny. They are, they are willingly doing this. They are doing this from just because they are used to. And so they have power. And um, yeah, and, and so how well, I, I wouldn't say he read Etienne de Boitier, but, but he shared his ideas. And yeah, I mean, the analysis of power is very, very revealing and insightful. I um, mean, in this question, more closer, I would be more closer to Arendt, where she, um, Arendt doesn't think that the power is a relation of anybody, even those who are oppressed. But this is a, um, it's not a possession of anybody, even those who are oppressed, but it's always a relation. And um, so it's not enough to think about power and powerlessness in the terms of a possession of an individual, although it empowered, yeah, it strengthened those who were seemingly oppressed or who were seemingly powerless. Good. So we, sorry, may I? <laughs> We have five more minutes. Um, I use this opportunity to tell you a little story, that a little story that you can take home, and then I will put it into a final question uh, to Milan. And then this session, unfortunately, is already over. So here's the little story, the little um, uh, um, reference, historical reference that I want to give you. Um, Next to uh, Václav Havel, maybe Milan Kundera is uh, one of the best known uh, uh, Czech intellectuals, writers uh, of the very same epoch. The two of them, Havel and Kundera, for a very long time, already starting in 1968, had a long quarrel about what it means to be a dissident and how, in some sense, uh, uh, how useful, how senseful, how intelligible it is to be a dissident. And uh, Kundera from the very beginning was attacking the dissidents and Havel in person, it was also a personal fight, but well, that's a, a side story, it was very much of a personal fight. Uh, ha Kundera attacked Havel from the ver very beginning in, in, by, by saying that you dissidents, you know, uh, for you it's actually, it's, it's not a wise decision, it's, it's totally unwise. Why do you go against a totalitarian regime, risking your own life, risking the life of your family without having ever any hope uh, for real change. It's just a stupid thing. And the only thing that I, Milan Kundera, uh, can uh, uh, see that is sensible in this and that makes sense is that you want to be prominent and that you want to become, become a hero. This is the only thing that, that really matters. There was a long debate. Uh, Havel re responded to it. Uh, Kundera responded back. And, and now this is the little story and that is what I give you at the very end. I think there is a late uh, reflection of this in one of the uh, dramas by Václav Havel, written 1978, the very same year as uh, our text, The Power of the Powerless. 1978, actually the premiere, as very often with Havel at that time, was in Vienna at the Book Theater. Uh, the, the play is called Protest, and it's part of the Vanyak trilogy. It's number three of the Vanyak trilogy, and those of, uh, those of you who know Havel a bit, you know that uh, Vanyak is an alter ego of himself. He's an intellectual working in a brewery. This was his own destiny. So, and then in this protest, there is the famous uh, talk between Vanyak and Stanyak. Stanyak is the other one. And in Stanyak, if you want, you don't have to, we don't have to, but we can see Kundera actually um, uh, personified. And so Stanyak, this friend, approaches his old friend Vanyak, and they always disagreed uh, on uh, should we be dissidents or not. And Stanyak always said, no, it makes no sense. Why should I risk my life? Why should I risk my career? I don't want to do this. And Vanyak always was the dissident. So, but then at some point Stanyak has a, a future son-in-law, a hopeful son-in-law, and this son-in-law becomes imprisoned, and obviously he wants his daughter to have the son-in-law back, and then he goes over to Vanyak and says, Vanyak, you have to write a pet petition uh, to release him, and Vanyak says, well, I have already written it, <laughs> it's already there, the only thing that has to be done is you have to sign it as well, and then Stanyak 
comes with his very long and painful explanations. You know, you know, ah, I can't do this at the moment. And in the end, the, the main line of his uh, argument is actually saying, well, I would do even more harm to it than any good to, to this, so I can't sign it. And you have to understand that I can't sign it. So you can take this as a late reflex on the Kundera um, 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 Havel debate in, in um, uh, Havel's uh, um, dramatic play. And what you see in here, I guess, is independent of the communist regime of Czechoslovakia or whatever, independent of all this, this is, a, this is an eternal, universal antagonism of how to behave in an oppressive regime, how to behave in a totalitarian regime. This is the, these are the questions that always come back. It, it's really, it's, it doesn't matter if you speak about today's China or, or, or uh, that time's uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, this is the eternal questions for dissidents. Do we really want to risk it? And I just take this as a final thing. Protest written 1978 is a wonderful thing. And if one only reads this very short passage, I find this very, very helpful, very instructive to see that. And maybe Milan, I give the final word to you now. I wanted to just mention this episode and maybe you can um, uh, tell us in the end. I put it in a very simple question. It's not, very, not, not that very fair, but also not that mean. So who, in the end, for you, maybe as your personal judgment, who came out as the winner in this debate between Kundera and, and Havel? <laughs> you can also have a as well as and on the other hand answer, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't give you a clear answer to, to, to your question, although the question is very clear. And I'm, well, I think we can understand the whole query also and we can interpret it differently. And well, the quarrel or struggle was, according to my reading, in, in 1968, more about the uh, interpretation of the Prague Spring and efforts to reform socialism. And uh, for Kund Kundera didn't share Havel's attitude that a socialism should be abundant and we should simply accept the Western model of capitalism, Western liberal democracy. And for Kundera, politics was a, you know, a mean to a tool, just a tool to um, to create culture. To, and according to him, uh, the 1968 and the years before were great, since it was the era where you know, it was the era in um, in, in which the best works appeared, best movies, best books were written ever in the, in the, in the whole century of in, uh, in the whole century of Czechoslovakian history. So um, for him it was great, and for Havel it was it was simply a you know a dead end. And since there was no uh, chance to to reform socialism, it was just a sh very short time of relief. But you know, the, it was still it was still an oppressive regime, and so uh, another I mean maybe another reflection in Kundera's book, books novels uh, can be found in, in a book on laughter and forgetting. It was published in German also. This book from Lassen Vergessen, uh, where I, it, it is a very complex novel, but in the first part. Uh, Kundera depicts a dissenter named Mirek. And um, what Mirek is doing is that he simply wants to be a martyr. And not only this, he stores his personal archive of letters and notes. And in those letters, there are his friends mentioned. He put them into danger, his relatives. And, but one thing he's also, he is attempting to, to get uh, from his former love from his young age, uh, uh, his love, Liebes Briefe, his letters, uh, why, he, why he did it. She was a communist, but it was not, not decisive. She was ugly. Yeah, and, and he wanted, Mirek wanted to, you know, to create a certain self-appearance he knew that he will be then and into jail, and he wanted his, you know, his collective, his his personal memory, his personal archive to be read it, and he wanted to be interpreted in some way. And to this 
uh, desired self-image, the love to the ugly girl simply didn't fit. And so what, what he was doing, Tim Burak was doing, was attempting to do, that he wanted to be a master of his personal memory. And according to Kundera, this is very similar to what communists attempt to do, to be masters of memory, masters of history, to erase people, to rename streets, to, to delete simply people from archives. And so, uh, final point, it is very, according to Kundera, very dangerous to suppose that uh, in the political opposition, that those who are in political opposition, who's, those who are dissenters, they might be brave, but that doesn't mean that they're always moral. Since moral, moral intentions lies beneath the surface, there are maybe sometimes even hidden to ourselves. So to, you know, to simply presuppose that those who are in opposition are moral persons and morally better is a danger. So I understand, Milan, you didn't want to give us a <laughs> yes or no answer or black or white answer. Um, I would at least dare to say that, but this is just my personal uh, uh, note, I would at least dare to say that Václav Havel was victor victorious somehow in the quarrel, but, and then there would be a very, very long but, and I save you from this long but now because we're already over time. The last thing I have to do uh, is, uh, and I uh, take pleasure in doing that, to thank Milan for being with us uh, on this discussion of Václav Havel's Power and the Powerless, and to thank you for being here, and uh, I hope that you got a bit of uh, also of a discussion of powerlessness, and maybe this is really something unique that we did today. I don't know if there's very many other events that actually discuss powerlessness, and, but uh, this I can't tell, and I'm happy to see you back, all of you, on some of the other events here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Luger. Thank you all.